Peak performance, section one, the growth equation. Two, rethinking stress. Chapter two, rethinking stress. In 1994, <laughs> in 1934, in McGill University Biochemistry Department, a 28 year old endocrinologist and assistant professor of medicine was attempting to discover a new hormone. His name was Hans Selje, and, she had, and he had every reason to believe he was making progress. When he injected rats with ovarian extract, hoping to elicit changes that could only be explained by an undiscovered sex hormone, the rats experienced a unique psychological response. The adrenal cortex became enlarged and their immune systems were activated. The more extract he injected, the greater the, her the response. Selje was certainly certain that a new sex hormone was triggering the psychological changes. He was elated. At the age of 28, I already seemed to be on the track of a new hormone, he wrote in his journal. Unfortunately for Sally, his enthusiasm wilted when he observed the same response after injecting rats with completely different fluids, fluids that had nothing to do with the reproductive system. Even a simple saline solution triggered the same response. His elation turned into heartbreak. All my dreams of discovery and new hormone were shattered. All of the time and all the materials that went into this long study were wasted. I became so depressed that for a few days I could not do any work at all. I just sat in the laboratory brought in. Though he didn't know, know it at the time, Selen's insisted brought in will turn out to be a blessing in disguise. As Sally continued to ruminate upon his experiments, eventually it occurred to him that perhaps he should evaluate what he, ha what, what he has witnessed from a different angle entirely. Maybe the liquid and the inje injection wasn't causing this response. Maybe the cause was the trauma of the injection itself. With that thought in mind, Selin emerged, emerged quickly from his rat and went about systematically traumatizing rats. He injected them, shocked them, operated on them, and, even, and everything in between. With each new act of trauma, he observed the same response. The rat's adrenal and immune systems became active. The rats weren't ready themselves for sex. They were ready themselves for a fight. While Selin's dreams of discovering a new hormone were dashed, his consolation prize was a big one. He unknowingly stumbled upon a concept that will become one of the foremost concerns in modern society. Stress. By doing something, anything really, that shocked or caused pain and discomfort in the rats. He could trigger an innate stress response that we know is shared by just about every living organism. The dose makes the, po the poison. The dose makes the poison. Stress isn't just harmful, it can also serve as a stimulus for growth and adaptation. Stress isn't harmful, it can also serve as a stimulus for growth and adaptation. The effects of stress depend almost entirely on the dose. The effects of the stress depends almost entirely on the dose. Sally and those who will build upon his work stay stress in humans and observe the same phenomenon that they saw in rats, but they also notice something else. Over time, humans and rats alike seem to adapt to each unique stressor, building up increased resistance. Certain stressors could even produce desirable effects. Strengthening the, the specific part of the body that was under duress. They learn that stress isn't just harmful, it can also serve as a stimulus for growth and adaptation. We know now, our adaptive stress response is rooted in molecules called inflammatory proteins and hormone called cortisol. Inflammatory proteins and cortisol are activated by stress and serve as biological messengers telling the body we're not strong enough to withstand this attack. As a result, the body's marshals arm and are and an army of biochemical building blocks are directed to the area under stress, making the body stronger and more resilient. This is the body's incredible reprogram, pre-programmed way of better preparing itself to face future th threats. As we mentioned earlier, strengthening a muscle such as your biceps is a wonderful example of how stress works in a positive way. Lifting a heavy weight to the point of exhaustion causes micro tears in the muscle tissue and triggers the stress, resp the stress response. The body becomes aware that it is currently not strong enough to tolerate the stress it is under. Consequently, once we cease lifting weights, the body transitions into something into something called an anabolic state, in which the muscle is built up so it can withstand more stress in the future. 
This process unfolds after just about any physical effort, from lifting weights to running to rowing to a challenging CrossFit workout. <coughs> if the lift amount of stress is too large or lasts too long, however, the body fails to adapt. It actually does the opposite of growing stronger. It deteriorates. Sally called this the exhaustion, exhaustion stage. Today, many refer to the exhaustion stage as being under chronic stress. The body rebels and enters something called the ca a catabolic process or a state of persistent breakdown. Rather than signaling for repairing, for repair and then subsiding, elevate inflammation and cortisol linger at toxic levels. The adrenal system constantly on guard becomes overworked and fatigued. This is why it is not at all surprising that chronic stress contributes to mere health problems. The body as, as a whole can withstand only as much tension before it breaks. <coughs> Put all this together and, and a paradox emerges. emerges. A stress can be positive, triggering desirable adaptation in the body, or a stress can be negative. Causing grave damage and harm. The effects of the stress depends almost entirely on the dose. And when applying the right dose, the stress does more than stimulate phys phys physiological ad adaptations. It stimulates psychological ones too. The skills come from struggle. The skills come from struggle. Growth comes at the point of resistance. In reflecting the post's development as a light performer, just waking the international chess prodigy turned making arts world champion who was profiled at the end of chapter one, had interest inside growth camps at the point of resistance. We learn by pushing ourselves to the outer reaches of our abilities. To the outer reaches of our abilities. Although it sounds like Watson is referring to a world in martial arts workout, what that's not the case. Watson is referring to his process, process of mastering chess, well before he even knew that Tai Chi was. During his chess practices, Watkins was stressing his mind to the point of complete exhaustion. While there are countless books about applying athletic training to non-athletic pursuits, Watkins did the opposite. He took the training philosophy that turned him into a world champion in chess and used it to become a world champion in, the mar in martial arts. Even, even when he was training only his mind, meticulously studying chess patterns and the deep structure underlying them. Watkins had to, strength, to stress himself. In order to elicit growth, he had to push at the point of resistance. Although Weskin inside occurred over 20 years ago, the latest science on learning is becoming to uncover why his method works. The frustrations of teachers at the public high school in Oakland County, Michigan, are similar to those of teachers all over the country. Oversized classes, digital device distractions, and of course not enough resources. But more than anything, the teachers are frustrated with the common core a standardized national curriculum to which they have been required to adhere. However, what intended the com Common Core may be, it aims to ensure a national baseline of education at each grade level. Its results in Oakland County has not been a good one. On a res recent visit, we heard the following. I get where the federal government is coming from in wanting some standards in education, but the result is a cookie cutter approach to teaching, it forces us to teach to the curriculum instead of teaching to the students, 11th grade science teacher. It subs the creativity right out of the classroom before it forces us to teach to certain tests, 9th grade English teacher. It is awful, it forces us to, st to spoon feed students, it's especially bad for the brightest kids since we don't have the freedom to push them, all the teaching happens inside the, inside the box, 10th grade economic teacher. These complaints have merit. There are specific testable facts in preparation for rigid standardized tests that doesn't promote learning. Real science shows that learning demands open-ended exploration that allows students to reach beyond the individual limits. In a series of duties involving middle schools and high school math classes, students who were forced to struggle on complex problems before receiving help from teachers outperform students who received immediate assistance. The author of this study summarizes their findings in a simple yet elegant statement. Skill comes from struggle. Another study titled Why do only some events cause learning during human tutoring? Found the answer was straightforward because most tutors swooping with, with answers and support far too early. 
in surveying different university levels physicists physics tutorial systems the researchers discovered that regardless of the tutorial explanation employed when the students were not at an in pace learning was uncommon the most effective tutorial systems on the other hand all shared one thing they delayed instruction until students reach the point of failure growth comes at the point of resistance a skills comes from a struggle <coughs> the same theme holds true in athletics whether it is a runner trying to get faster a baseball player working on a new move or a big wave surfer attempting to master a challenging ride the greatest gains often fall in mass struggle and, and, dis and discomfort <coughs> nick lamp is one of the best big wave surfers in the world he rides waves that are that are as tall as four-story buildings. <coughs> as a four-story buildings. Though his performances on the wider seem magical, they are grounded in the meticulous approach to training and a bulletproof mindset that he cultivates cultivates day in and day out. When Brad interviewed with Lamb for Outside Magazine, he was especially interested to learn how Lamb prepares himself to face the strongest swells. Lamb's secret lies in making himself un uncomfortable. During training, I seek out and try to ride waves that scare me, Lamb said. It is only when you step outside your comfort zone that your growth, being uncomfortable, is the path to personal development and growth. It is the opposite of complacency. Lamp embraces the challenge, seeing failure not as a setback but as an opportunity to grow. If I never push the envelope, the envelope, I never struggle. I will never get better, he said. If anything, the times that Lamp is supremely challenged or comes up short are often the most valuable. They uncover both physical and psychological weak spots and provide insights into areas he can improve. They fully engage both his brain, both his brain and his body, his brain and body, into trying to figure out the problem. Idea rise, idea rise, they bar, they bar of what Lamb considers possible. What waits can students who learn successfully and Lamb practices something known as productive failure. There is broad scientific consensus that the most profound learning occurs when we experience this sort of failure. Rather than simply answering specific questions, it is beneficial to be challenged and even to fail. Failure provides a, an opportunity to analyze, analyze a problem from different angles, pushing us to understand its deep underlying structure and to tone the transferable skill for problem solving itself. Sure, immediate assistance can be highly satisfying, but when succumb to the impulse for instant resolution, we miss out on a special kind of deep learning that only a challenge can spawn. System 2. Learning. Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman, PhD, states that the human mind is divided into two types of thinking, System 1 and System 2. System 1 operates automatically and quickly. It often drives by instinct and intuition. System 2, on the other hand, is more thoughtful, analytical, and notices effortful mental activities. System 1 is out of default mode of thinking because it requires less energy when we are on, a, on an autopilot. System 1 is at work and on current mental mode, model of the world dominates. It is only when we activate System 2, but really working hard and struggling to figure out something out out that we have the best chance of examining new information critically and integrating it into our web of knowledge through learning requires system two to understand system two learning is such a challenge we need to look deep inside of the brain our actual web of, no of con knowledge consists of brain cells called neurons that are linked by axons which functions like fine electrical wires in the brain when we learn something new electrical activity travels be between neurons along the axons at first the connections are weak both figuratively and literally, and we struggle with the new skill. Whether it is properly using, using grammar or using our dom, non-dominant hand on the basketball court, if we gain it, if we give it, if we give in, opting not to struggle, system one takes over. We default to the already strong connection, connections in our brain, and continue using adjectives instead of adverbs of driving with our right hand instead of our left. But if we endure the struggle and keep working at the new skill, the connection between neurons, neurons is strengthened. This occurs partially thanks to the substance, substance called myelin. Myelin is like the brain version of insulation wrapping around our axons. As we work more at something, more, more myelin is generated and that enables electrical activity to travel more fluidly between neurons. In, order, in other words, the connections in our brain strengthens over time our former struggles become second nature if we 
stick to learning something for long enough or was once a formidable system two challenge becomes become a simple system one task just ask anyone who learned how to dribble with the, her non-dominant hand or just ask yourself what does three plus two equal how about six times four think back answering this question wasn't always easy so easy this is not to say that endless struggle promotes learning but it does mean that the best learning occurs when we really have to work for it. Just like struggling to eke out one last repetition in the weight room is a great method for growing the body. Struggling with the point of failure and only then receiving assistance is a great recipe for growing the mind if you want to consciously improve in whatever it is that you do. You've got to view stress as something positive, even desirable. Although too much or never ending stress can be dangerous. The right, amount, the right amount serves as a powerful stimulus for growth. Just like struggling, the eke out one last repetition in the weight room is a great method for growing the body. Struggling the, to the point of failure, on only, on only the receiving assistance is a great recipe for growing the mind. Performance practices. Stress stimulates growth. As the chest Prodigy turned martial arts champion John Watson says, Growth comes at the point of resistance. Developing a new capability requires effort. Skills come from, from a struggle. When you struggle, System 2 is activated and through development is underway. Myelin is accumulating and neural connections are, are strengthening. strengthening. Fail productively. Only seek out support after you allow yourself to struggle. Use manageable challenges. <coughs> when psychologist Mihaly, assistant to Mihaly, PhD, was studying how the best performance, performers get in the zone and continue to improve, he noticed they all regularly push themselves to their limits, and perhaps just a bit beyond, in an attempt to cover the mystical zone into something a bit less nebulous. Assistant to Mihaly developed an elegant conceptual, conceptual tool. Challenge level, skill level, anxiety, worry, apathy, boredom, relaxation, control, flow, flow, arousal. Shishang Timihi tool not only can help you find your way into the zone, but it can also double as a great way to dial in the optimal, optimal amount of stress required for growth. The best kind of a stress, what we like to call just manageable challenges, lies in the upper right corner of the flow section. Just manageable challenges. Manifest when you take on something that makes you feel a little out of control but not quite anxious or overly aroused. When the task at hand is a bit beyond your skills, you're in the sweet spot. Any less of a challenge and you feel like I've got this in the, in the back. It'd be too easy and not stressful enough, it's stressful enough to serve you as stimul stimulus for growth. Any more of a challenge, however, and the unnerving feeling of your heart pounding in your ears will make it hard to focus. What you're after is the sweet spot when the challenge at hand is on the outer edge of or perhaps just beyond your current skill. What you're after is the sweet spot when the challenge at hand is on the outer edge of, of or perhaps just beyond your current skill. A little doubt and uncertainty is actually a good thing. A little doubt and an uncertainty is actually a good thing. It signals that a growth opportunity has emerged. The workout that Steve designs for his world-class distance runners, such as Sarah Hall, a prime example of just manageable challenges prior to finishing near the top of the field in the 2016 World Half Marathon Championships, Hall completed a 15-mile tempo runner at staggering 5 minutes 30 seconds per mile pace, ever so slightly faster than they ever had before, than she ever had before. These workouts are designed to stretch limits, pushing runners beyond their current abilities. As a result, it is not uncommon for Steve's at least to show up to practice a bit nervous. Some may even question whether they will be able to complete the workout, while armchair sports psychologists might say this kind of doubt and uncertainty is not negative. Steve has a different take. A little doubt and uncertainty is actually a good thing. It signals that a growth opportunity has emerged. The little voice inside your head saying, I can't possibly do this, is actually a sign that you're on the right track. It is your mind trying to pull you back at the, to the familiar path that represents your comfort zone. Just, just manageable challenges are about venturing off on a known path and going down a slightly more demanding one. <coughs> this concept applies 
to just about anything, whether it is a workout, musical performance, or project at the office. That's the beauty of using Manhis diagram. You can plot any activity on it. When doing so, it is important to account for the many contextual factors that can make an activity more or less challenging at a given point in time. External fa factors could, could include weather, size of the audience, or stakes of the outcome, price money, deadlines, the people you're assigned to work with, if group, team, project, internal factors could include other stresses in your life at, at the time, your personal interest and motivation for the activity, your physical and mental health. Consider the activities you engage in on an everyday. What do they fall on? Systematically, Healy diagram. <coughs> are you pursuing growth in a healthy, sustainable way? We are suggesting that you spend all of your time immersing in just manageable challenges. Doing so is probably not very practical, plus you still need to recover in between doubts of stress for the effort to be beneficial. What we are suggesting, however, is that for the capabilities you wish to grow, whether they be financial modeling, portrait painting, distance running, or anything in between, you should regularly seek out just manageable challenges, activities that take you out of your comfort zone and force you to push at the point of resistance for growth. In this chapter, we explore the benefits of stress, examine why skills come from struggle, and learn what types of activities fall into the category of good. Growth from modern stress, what we call just manageable challenges. We Next, we will we'll explore the mechanics of how you should go about working on them and explain why so much of the connect, conventional wisdom on productive work misses the mark. <coughs> Performance practices. <coughs> Think of a skill, capability that you want to grow. Access your current ability to perform skills, capability. Actively seek out challenges that just barely exceed your ability. If you feel fully in control, make the next challenge a bit harder. If you feel anxious or so aroused that you can focus, dial things down a notch. Thank you.